So welcome back to uh, track two, uh, patient's role in drug discovery. Uh, we want to thank Biogen for providing the break today. Um, I'm Ken Tolke. For those of you who hadn't been in track two before, uh, I'm the executive vice president for scientific and medical affairs at PRA Health Sciences. We're very proud to be a partner uh, with Global Genes in sponsoring the Rare Patient Advocacy Summit. Uh, and I happen to be the host for track two. Uh, I want to make sure that we uh, also say hi to all the folks that are joining us remotely through the Platform Q uh, live stream today, which is pretty cool. Uh, we're lucky this afternoon to be joined by Dr. Ethan Perlstein, who's the founder and CEO of Perlstein Labs. Uh, he'll be sharing his expertise on animal models, which I started my career in a long, long, long time ago. Um, and he'll explain a little bit more about the importance of kind of the animal model in the process of drug development and the different stages of uh, R&D. So welcome, Ethan. Awesome. Thank you all for coming. I think this is on. Okay, thank you all for coming. This, I'm really happy to be here. This is my fourth uh, Global Genes, so I'm really honored to be able to speak here and talk to you guys about uh, the wonderful world of animal models. Uh, so a little bit briefly about me. Uh, so actually the company is, has just undergone a rebrand, so we're now uh, Pearl Lara instead of Pearlstein Lab, so definitely check out our new site, perlaro.com. But we're a San Francisco-based drug discovery company uh, that's focused on rare genetic diseases. And in particular, our approach is, is about exploiting simple animal models, maybe the animal models that you never maybe the animals that you never thought could be models for disease. And that's what I want to take you through a little discussion um, uh, with today. So everyone knows about the diagnostic odyssey. Uh, so at, at some point you want to be able to say with certainty that the disease is caused by this specific mutation. And for most folks, we can I, hopefully get to this, this point in time. But this is just the first of many odysseys. Uh, so the next odyssey after the diagnostic odyssey, you could call the, the basic research odyssey. If you don't really know anything about the gene in question, well, you have to go in there and figure out, well, how does the mutation cause the gene to break or the protein to break? Uh, what happens, what's the consequence of that in, in the liver uh, or in the brain or in whatever cell type? Maybe some cell types don't show an effect, but all that stuff has to be elucidated. Um, and that takes time. And then, of course, the next odyssey is the drug discovery odyssey. And so what, we, what I hope to tell you is that this wonderful world of simple animal models um, hopefully can accelerate uh, this, this, uh, this process. And so you know, cells are wonderful model systems for disease. I'm not gonna talk anything or much about sort of cell-based systems, uh, although they are part, uh, we think they're part of sort of a portfolio of models one should use when, when attacking a disease. Uh, but I'm not gonna really talk about all the efforts that are done in cells, although most of pharma actually is doing drug discovery uh, with cells or even with proteins, not with the animals that I will talk about. So the real organizing principle here is Noah's Ark, and not the big animals that you normally associate with Noah's Ark, like the elephants and the giraffes and the tigers, but the animals that would have been lurking around the bottom of the Ark that you wouldn't see. Maybe the biggest one would be a mouse uh, or a rat. And there are even some animals that you could use for drug discovery that are invisible to the naked eye. Uh, and I want to tell you about this, this wonderful world. But we have to acknowledge first that mouse is king. So this is a, this data from a couple of years ago, looking at the number of citations in PubMed, which is the, the main repository for, for, for peer-reviewed scholarly work in the biomedical sciences. And you can see the black line, uh, the number of studies involving mice is sort of just taking off. And presumably this trend has maintained um, this course over the last five years. Um, and, and you know, this trend really started at the start of the century. Uh, you know, there was once a, a large number of different animal models, uh, mammalian animal models that people used to use, literally the guinea pig, uh, rabbits, and, and other creatures. Uh, but, but mice started to take over at the beginning of the century when, when scientists started to inbreed them to do, be, able, to be able to do more carefully controlled genetic studies. Um, uh, and actually, 40 years ago, the first transgenic mouse was created by Rooney Anish. Uh, and so that has obviously enabled so much work and exploration in terms of creating mouse models for disease. So mouse is king, but mouse hopefully is, I want to tell you or uh, make you believe that mouse is not the only uh, game in town. And that's supported also from data from the same paper looking at non-rodent animal models. Uh, all of these are still uh, mammals except for zebrafish, that black line. Uh, but for the most part, uh, this, the, you can see, you can notice, if you remember from the previous slide, the, the scale here, you're talking tens of thousands of mouse papers being produced at a time. Uh, and so the scale here is much lower for these other animals. Um, but there is, you know, there, there is a creeping kind of polyculture where more and more non-mouse models are becoming uh, popular. In fact, 
what we focus on are non-rodent, non-mammalian models. So these are the things that um, you, know, you wouldn't necessarily consider uh, in pharma, but they've been used by basic scientists for decades uh, to understand how biology works. So it's just a reminder of, of a simplified family tree connecting us and the so-called simple models, or sometimes these are referred to as model organisms. And so these are basically yeast worms, flies, and fish. Uh, specifically zebrafish, fruit flies, nematodes, uh, and, and baker's yeast, or brewer's yeast. And the point of this slide is to remind folks that these are all animals. The yeast cell is the simplest single-celled animal, but they're still animals. Uh, we last shared a common ancestor a billion years ago, but a quarter of yeast genes have a human counterpart. Uh, so that's still pretty remarkable. And as you march your way closer to humans, you get more and more of the genes being conserved. So two out of five worm genes are conserved in people, three out of five fly genes are conserved in people, and uh, three out of four fish genes are conserved in people. And the genes that are conserved tend to disproportionately be the ones that actually cause disease. So we think model organisms, the non-mammalian, uh, small, even like yeast, microscopic model organisms, are actually pretty well suited to study certain classes of Mendelian diseases, in particular diseases that involve ancient biology, ancient biology of the cell that hasn't changed much despite all of this evolution. So our platform, and I think others, you know, can, I hope will, will emulate this, but this is really a, a sort of a portfolio approach that we're taking, is to say with the advent of CRISPR, you can now deploy all these animal models in ways that you couldn't really do before. Uh, in the past, the genome editing technologies was very specific for different critters, and it's hard to make a kind of apples to apples model. But now with CRISPR, you can go in there and, and take a mutation that is derived from a particular uh, patient. You can program that mutation into these animal models. You can investigate at the cellular level and convince yourself that you've recreated whatever the disease is in the fish or the fly. And now you've got a sick organism that you can now do drug discovery on. And that's, that's exactly what we've been doing. So I'll just briefly go through a little bit more detail these, uh, these four model organisms, the, the workhorses for our platform. And, and again, these are the workhorses for biology in general. Almost all observations that we know about human biology uh, root back to some observation, even in the simplest kind of animal, like, like the yeast cell. So yeast is a fungus, but it is a, technically an animal. Uh, we last shared a common ancestor, as, ancestor with yeast, as I said, about a billion years ago. Uh, but in spite of that, there's a large part of the yeast single cell physiology that's conserved. So in other words, if you take a random yeast cell and look at its plumbing, that plumbing looks not too different from the plumbing of a typical human cell, um, sort of in a, in a generic sense, in the way that you can see the family resemblance uh, of a Model T in a current Tesla. Um, now, go up in complexity a bit. So yeast are single-celled animals. Um, now, go to nematodes, or C. elegans. Uh, this was a model organism that's a, it's a, free, it's a free dwelling soil critter. It was first domesticated, uh, as yeast was actually. All these animals had, were domesticated. Uh, nematodes were first domesticated in the 60s as a model organism uh, of choice, a new model organism of choice at the time that was thought to be superior to sort of single celled organisms. Uh, you've got you know, a couple thousand cells per animal. Uh, in fact, people have actually studied the, 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 the path of a single fertilized nematode. Uh, uh, embryo all the way to the fully formed adult and can trace each lineage of the cells from all divisions from beginning to adult. So it's been extremely well characterized. Um, it's got neurons, but a few of them, so you know, no real organs to speak of, but there is communication between, for example, the primordial gut of the larva and, and its neurons. Um, so it's a wonderful system that's been exploited by geneticists for insights into base biology, and we, we're proposing that it should be used for drug discovery as well. Next up the chain, fruit flies. Fruit flies are great. So they're still invertebrates, no backbone, just like the worm. The worm was a simple invertebrate. This is a complex invertebrate. invertebrate. Now you do have uh, this, you know, insects do have, for example, brains. Uh, and in fact, there's, uh, you know, wonderful, wonderful, the root of genetics actually comes from, from work in flies. And figuring out, for example, that genes are physically on chromosomes and that they're linked to each other that way. That was all work actually figured out 100 years ago using flies. And then zebrafish is kind of the newest kid on the block. It's a vertebrate, uh, and I omitted one of the important organs here, which is a liver, and that's usually really key, especially in drug discovery efforts. The liver is a very important organ. Uh, but zebrafish were uh, sort of come onto the scene in genetics a couple of decades ago, and they're still obviously much cheaper than, than mice, but they're vertebrates, and so you've got that benefit of having that closer homology than, for example, a fruit fly. Uh, but again, we're looking for the area of biology that is gonna likely be conserved across these species. And so the, the approach that we're taking um, is really one that says we think about these disease models as sort of a portfolio. We don't want to do drug discovery or, or any kind of effort really in understanding a disease that's based solely on using one model. 
uh, because the, the, that one model could fail. Uh, and I think that's the major lesson we've learned from, from, from why drug development discovery, the failure rate is so high, is that the preclinical models are not predicting what's happening in people. And it goes without saying, but how do we start to deconstruct the situation so we fix it and we make better preclinical models? And we argue that you're not going to make one model the best. It's really about diversifying and, and hedging and making multiple models of the same exact disease and then looking for points of consensus and trying to explain away points of difference. So the approach that we've sort of taken is to say, let's use, let's kind of use this flow, flow chart for doing drug discovery. So we, we can recreate a disease in a simple animal, a worm, fly, yeast. If we could do it in all three, perfect. If we can do it in only two out of three or one out of three, that's still okay. We can recreate disease in that animal model and then look for, in this case, we can look for small molecules. You can do a lot of things with these models once you create them. Um, but in the, in the case where you want to use them as a substrate for screening, you can then look for small molecules that can reverse disease in the animal. That would be step one. Step two would be, let's take those molecules that we know are active in this simple animal, and now let's make sure that they work in a human cell. And we can get human cells from patients. Uh, we, can get, um, you know, we can get a skin fibroblast biopsy, and you could even try to turn that into a, a pluripotent stem cell through some genetic engineering, and then you could redifferentiate into various other tissues. Uh, the point is, you want to be able to say, you have two-factor authentication, or at least multi-factor authentication. You've got a molecule that works in one of the simple animals, okay, check. Next step, does that molecule work in a patient cell, in a human cell, and does it actually modify disease phenotypes that are seen at the cellular level? Yes, second check. Okay, next, um, does it work in a vertebrate? Because you could now just say, let's go straight to the mouse, but we wanna be a little bit more cautious. So let's say, let's take, in this next step in the sequence, let's take that molecule that was both active in a simple animal and in human cells, and now let's put it on a fish, and then, if that were to still work, we can have it culminate in mouse validation. And that mouse validation is usually the point where it's kind of this universally recognized you know, po uh, stopping point or transfer point uh, in terms of development. So for example, a small company like us can take a molecule to uh, uh, mouse efficacy, and that's sort of the minimum, minimally viable partnerable asset. So that's the, that's the furthest we can take it before a, pharma co a larger company than us would be interested in doing further development work. So that's one model, this, this scheme that we've done where you do the animal first and then kind of check in the cell and then work your way back to the more complicated higher order, higher, higher order animal, that's the flow that we're working on. Um, but you could also imagine doing a slight variation of this where you kind of flip the order in the beginning. I told you, you know, I, I told you I wasn't gonna talk about cell-based screening, but um, you could imagine a scenario where you are modeling the disease in a cell. You convince yourself that you can change, you know, um, disease phenotypes at the cellular level. But now you want to you know, put that into a mouse. But you don't want to go straight from a cell to a, to, an, to a mouse. And that's generally what happens. And there's already a lot of failure associated with that. So could you do anything to mitigate that? Well, what if as your second step, you then introduce those simple animals? And then you kind of worked your way up almost the complexity chain and now go back and culminate in the mouse. And the theory is that if you had a molecule that was active across all these species, um, that should also mean you, you, you have a good sense of what the molecule is doing, or at least you have an ability to, to do the detective work to figure out what the molecule is doing and prove that it's doing the same thing across all these animals. And then that sets up the expectation that, well, if all those processes and those, uh, uh, and those drug targets are, are in a human being, then you have the expectation that it should also work there. Never guaranteed. In fact, it's already known that you can take a lot of compounds that do perfectly well of curing disease in mice and do nothing in human beings. And I'm asking you to now go back even further but what I'm saying is don't just go from, say, yeast to mouse. I'm saying use this portfolio, use this council of elders to inform you on what is the right sort of consensus view of the disease, and don't rely too much on any one given model. Now, we've put this into practice uh, in two different programs that we've uh, started the company on. The first is a lysosomal storage disease called neiman pick type C. And neiman pick C, we chose that as the, actually the first disease to, to, to put into our platform for a number of reasons. The, the primary reason was because the gene responsible for neiman pick c and PC1 is a really ancient gene. So yeast have a version of it, worms have a version of it, flies have a version of it, and everything in between as well. And so what we were able to do is take advantage of academic studies that had already been published that showed you could make MPC disease in a fly, you could make MPC disease in a worm, and they get sick at a cellular level kind of like humans do. And so what we did is we followed a particular track here where we, we had a worm model of MPC. We had, we had the other models as well, but I'll tell you the story of how we went in this particular order where we found a molecule that could rescue disease, it could rescue neiman pick C disease, as it were, in the worm. 
Step two was, okay, put it into a human patient fibroblast. And this is a cell that you could get from Coriel, which is a great biobank that um, hopefully everyone is depositing samples there. And that allows researchers from both commercial and uh, academic labs to access those materials. So second step was, let's now test this worm active molecule in an MPC patient fibroblast and ask, could you change any of this disease phenotypes at the cell level? And you could, so check two. And then the next step, uh, we actually didn't have a zebrafish available. We actually just made an MPC knockout zebrafish, and it has a lot of the same developmental problems as all the other animals. It's, MPC is a childhood disease in these animals, too. Um, and so now we're at a point where we're looking in mice. So there's a mouse model available, and we're now testing to see if one of the molecules that we discovered in this flow is also active in the mouse. And that's work underway now. And we got to this point in less than a year, and at half of the traditional cost of getting from essentially setting up a screen, booting up a screen, to getting to a, a lead compound in a mouse. Um, and yes, that's, this early phase of the drug discovery process is the least expensive, um, but if you get it wrong now, you don't realize it, and you, don't, and you pay a high cost for it much, much later. So that's the, kind of the scheme for the first program. I mean, in an ideal world, you could have used all, you could have recreated even pixie disease in all of these animals. And ideally, you would do, you would do it all over the place. But we didn't have that luxury uh, as a young startup. We had to kind of prioritize and make choices. So this was the flow that we ended up doing. If we had to do it again, we probably would, and we are actually going to have the opportunity to do it again, we would do it where we would bring more of these models to bear. And for our second disease called NGLI1 deficiency, um, you know, loosely part of the congenital collect oscillation disorders, but also has other features where it looks like a mitochondrial disease and also looks like there's proteasome malfunction. But in any case, here the flow is we have a fly model of the disease. So the NGLI1 gene is ancient, so the yeast and worms and flies and so on have a version of it. But based on the published work, people found that when you gave NGLI1 deficiency to the yeast, it wasn't so obvious that it was sick in a way that you could use that to benefit um, drug discovery. Same thing with the worm. Uh, but with the fly, there was a very obvious problem with the flies. They didn't develop normally. Uh, so again, this is, a this is a developmental disorder in humans and children, and it's a developmental disorder in these animals as well. And so the screen is, can we find small molecules that can reverse that developmental delay? And so we're now actually just started doing drug repurposing screens where we have a collection of known FDA-approved drugs and other bioactive compounds and other, other known compounds, a set of 2,500, and we can now pilot um, this set against this NGLI1 mutant fly and see what happens. And this is something that we want to be doing more broadly in terms of partnering uh, with either families or charities or even uh, you know, national level foundations where we say, we want, to do, we want to do discovery as a service. And that starts with essentially doing a natural history study in the simple animals. And that natural history study for developmental disease is really fast in these simple animals because their lifespan is really short. And so you can really fully characterize the defects um, very, very, in, a, in a relatively rapid period of time in these simple animals. So step one would be do a natural history study in the simple animal. Step two um, would then be you know, do, a, do a drug repurposing screen. Uh, if, the, if the disease model is sick in a way that looks like the mouse and the person, then that gives you confidence to say, if I could find a chemical that could reverse that in the fly, it might have a chance of also reversing it in the mouse or one day maybe even in a person. So that's, that's, that's how we kind of imagine this process going. When you have this portfolio of animals at your disposal, you can go ahead and figure out, based on your disease gene, whether it's ancient enough, essentially, and a, a bunch of other factors have to be right as well, that you can now bring to bear all of these models, and in different combinations, and in different orders, you can go ahead and commence with drug discovery. Again, culminating at a point where you get something that works in a mouse, because that's the point where investors, that's sort of an inflection point that investors want to see, as proof of a program working, that's an inflection point that potential bigger pharma companies want to see before they invest in an early stage program. They want to wait because they know the failure rate's so high. So they want to make sure you get to at least this kind of minimum point, which is, which is mouse validation. So that, we, we want to offer an ability to go step by step, milestone by milestone, get to that point, and then have sort of a partnerable asset that can be developed by another party. So I think I definitely did the micro machine imitation there and it went really fast. But I'm hoping then to therefore have some time for, for um, for, for feedback. So with that, please, please give me questions. Yeah, please. So I think there's a mic coming for you. Sorry, excuse my pretty ignorant question, no. but um, how do you know if your disease is based on an ancient gene? So there, there, it turns out that the genome sequence for, you know, for almost now a large number of organisms is just known. You can look it up in a database. 
And so the thing you would do, the order of operation would be, you tell me what the name of the gene is, we can go to the database, we can type it in, there's multiple databases that do this, and then it will just tell you, yes, this gene exists in ancient form in the following other animals or other organisms. If it's a super ancient gene, it could be even present in bacteria, right? That all life might share certain genes. Um, so that would be kind of the, the, how you know is based on looking up in like a big genome lookup table and ask, is there an ancient version of this gene? And you can tell because when you do an alignment, what they call alignment, you can take the, you can turn the protein sequence, which is really just a string of letters. The amino acids are just represented as letters. And then you can take that string from the human gene and compare it to that string from the mouse gene. And then convince yourself that, wow, 80% of the letters are exactly the same and their position is also the same. That's also key. So all this can be now very trivially determined, simple couple of keystrokes in search. Yeah. Yeah, please. Oh, so sorry, yeah, the mic. Mike Smedley with the Curing Retinal Blindness uh, Foundation. So I have an off-the-path question Great. With, with mice. Our gene is the CRP1, and it's been determined to be in the black 6N. Mm -hmm. So my question is, is there any value to all the experiments that have been done out there that we could go to the database, collect that information, and maybe find some useful information for us? Sure, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, but for example, you know, there, for, for a lot of the models that we're very, for a lot of diseases we're interested in modeling, a mouse model already exists. The problem is that there aren't this, there isn't a deep bench of other models. And sometimes it, there is no possibility for that because the gene's not ancient enough. And so the worm and the fly or the yeast cannot, simply don't have that gene, they don't have that biology, so they can't model it. Um, but otherwise, if you already have in place a known set of mouse models. And what's key is also having mouse models potentially in different backgrounds. You mentioned the black six background. It's very well known that you can take the same exact mutation, put it into different backgrounds of mice, so the C57 black mouse versus the BALP C white mice. You can put the same exact mutation in two different backgrounds and you'll have a different disease progression. It might be more severe in one mouse than the other, which is what you see in people after all. And in fact, that same result has been shown across all these animals. You can create the same genetic mutation if you put it in a different background, a different animal strain background, you may get a completely different result. So you, that, if that's published, that's also helpful. At the end of the day, there is no one unitary model that's going to say everything. That, that one unitary model that explains everything is the patient. But you can't obviously do the clinical trial on them until the very end. So. Hey, so we have a mouse model already um, that we made a couple of years ago. And um, where we are at this point is that it does not exhibit any CNS defects. Mm -hmm. And so that's a huge part of our um, disorder. So now we're kind of going back to the drawing board, looking at um, redoing the mouse, essentially. And I found it interesting when you talked about diversifying. So, um, you know, we're looking at a zebrafish too, but these are all really costly things for small patient advocacy groups. So, I mean, what... What is your take on that, and um, how, how do you think we can best approach that? Yeah, so on the, the second question first, so the, the, the cost of doing things with flies and worms and yeast, I mean, already the cost of fish versus mouse is like, you know, a couple of cents on the dollar. And I just imagine how much more of a savings you get when you drop down to flies and worms. So if the gene is there, and you can convince yourself that the lower animal gets sick in the same way that the higher animals do, then, you know, you've got these much more economical resources, or much more econo a much more economical path to establishing that you have disease models that could be a, a, a pipeline for your mouse work. Now, if your mouse model is incomplete in some way, like it's a certain tissue or a certain patho path pathophysiology is missing, you know, there could be different explanations for that. It could be as trivial as if you put it in a different background, all of a sudden you get it. Or if you feed it a different chow, all of a sudden now you see something. So if, you've, if you can convince yourself you've ruled out those explanations, if it's really that there's something about mouse biology, regardless of where that mouse, where that mouse's background is, if it's something where the, the disease doesn't produce a brain effect, well, that may just be that in the mouse, the biology is such that you, for whatever reason, we can't explain it yet, it doesn't manifest, and it's not a problem of the strain. How do you know that, what's, which is what you can spend a lot of time ruling things out. So, I think that the word of caution is that if you, if you have limited funds, it, it makes most sense to spend those on models that you know, are close enough or have the promise to be close enough that it's not a complete waste of money and that even if it's only 10% relevant, it's still better than what you had before. It's still a one, one piece of bread versus no loaf at all, which I think is still, still a better situation to be in. Yeah. 
Melissa. So forgive me if this is an obvious question, but when you're screening um, the repurposed drugs, you said you mentioned 2,500. Um, where are those drawn from? Um, are you are they something that acts on that particular um, uh, biology of that disease, or how do you identify that? So those? the thinking there is we wanted to have a, a, a set of, so it's not all the FDA approved drugs, it's about half, but it's a set that's sold by commercial vendors that sell these compound libraries and they put, put this co collection together. So, um, so yeah, so the, the idea is that it represents um, kind of a wide set, an unbiased wide set of compounds that do all kinds of things to cells. And they're not, they're not all just like cancer drugs, for, for instance. They're, they're supposedly, you know, although FDA approved drugs tend to be enriched for cancer drugs, because a lot of them, that's what they do. Um, it, nonetheless, this is supposed to be a set that's kind of like, you know, this is a way, these molecules tickle all kinds of biology. And so you're setting yourself up to maybe really find something new. Uh, and, and useful, right? Because it's the idea is you obviously want to have if you if you could if you could, if you could afford to skip over a phase one safety trial and skip all the regulation entirely, you can buy yourself time through disease maintenance or stabilization, as you then embark on the real dis the real transformative new drug discovery effort. After the repurposing. So, are you expecting or have you used um, this preclinical work? moving toward an IND, or what role do you see it playing in the entire drug uh, evaluation and approval process? So I think there's, like, there's really two exit points for, for someone who is doing this early stage preclinical work. You can either essentially exit at the mouse efficacy stage and say, look, this molecule represents maybe a family of molecules that has this particular target and it has this effect, and that's, you know, then you can establish things like target exclusivity, because some of the bigger pharma companies really only want to do a deal with a smaller company or a smaller group if they can get exclusivity on the drug target, not necessarily on the disease, but on the drug target. So first exit point is sort of like, well, is it working in a mouse? Um, then kind of the next exit point would probably, if you don't know that when you know the mouse work, the next exit point might be, well, we've proven that, it's, that the compound has this new mechanism, and it's an exciting new mechanism that's never been explored before. That could generate some interest. But probably, the, really, the next, next step after mouse efficacy would be getting your IND enabling package together. And right now, that's too costly for a company like us to be doing that on a repeated basis since we're a platform, not focusing on one particular disease. But I imagine in the future, it will become more cost effective for us to hold on to an asset. And this would be in the context, say, of a partnership too. We could hold on to the asset beyond mouse efficacy. Because if you hold an asset to IND, IND ready, it's like worth 10, 20, 30 times more than it would be if you had to part with it much sooner. So, and the cost to get there is not 10 times more, but it's still millions of dollars, which is a lot for a small company or charity that you know, can't marshal those kinds of resources easily. So, yeah. Hi, um, do you have an opinion on in silico modeling and how it fits into uh, what, you've, what you've just gone over? And also, if you could maybe touch on high throughput screening and the benefits of that for you know, what the kind of work you do. Well, in silico, you should talk to this guy here, Alexander, raise your hand. So he has a company called Atomwise, which is all about using AI and, and computational methods for drug discovery. Big fan of that. We see them as sort of like an Iron Man suit where we can do our drug discovery efforts with these simple animals and with small numbers of compounds, but we can feed them this data that can make us much more, seem like we're much bigger because they can then take our small data set of real data and then go do some what they call virtual screening, go see if they can use that as a way to inspire finding new molecules, all computationally. So we, we definitely are very excited about, that, about, about sort of AI and computational approaches for accelerating uh, this early stage, especially for phenotypic drug discovery. So what I kind of implied here is that when you do screens in these whole animals, you don't know what the compound's doing. You have to go do the detective work and figure out the so-called target. And a lot of companies, a lot of pharma companies don't like that idea. It's either risky or they've seen it fail in the past. They would prefer to know from the very beginning, oh, gene X is, if you, if, you, if, you, if you get rid of gene X, the disease goes away. They like to think about it in that way. But with these kinds of animal screens, you don't have that luxury. You don't know what the molecule's doing. You have to do that detective work. And so that you know, requires some effort, and then the you know, silico can assist with that. Now, in terms of what, what, what's your question about high throughput screening? And Yeah, I mean, we're definitely, so we, we are a big fan of, of high throughput and increasingly of, of like automation. So right now, most of our process is very manual. And so, you know, we, we want to turn that, uh, we're, you know, scientists are just managing data, not managing, you know, pipettes. Um, but yeah, we, we're committed to high throughput and um, I don't know if that answered your question, but happy to follow up.
Got a couple of minutes here. My son's condition, he has a shank 3 mutation. One of his shank 3 is regular, the other one is mutated. Um, what would be the end all be all? Like, I'm guessing what you're trying to come up with is a drug that is going to maybe silence the mutated gene? So, so there could be multiple ways a drug would work. So one way um, would be, yeah, so in, in one instance, you can have a case where if you know a gene, a gene X, if gene X is on and, and that causes disease, then, then you'd say, well, I want to get rid of gene X. And there's many ways you can do that. You can do it with a small molecule inhibitor. You can do it with sort of the ionis approach using this RNA knockdown, you know, a ASO RNA knockdown approach. Um, but what, what if in another instance you want to turn on gene X and that's how you get out of the disease rut? Well, then you can't knock the gene down. You have to give the gene back. Uh, you could do that with a small molecule that activates, say, another protein. Um, or um, so that, that would be sort of called a bypass, where you kind of get a, you don't try to resuscitate the residual broken gene, you just try to go around it. And then you can have the approach where you actually try to squeeze out some more function out of the broken gene. So if you only have one copy that's working and one that doesn't, maybe you can find a small molecule called a chaperone. It says this is the cystic fibrosis idea of the corrector compound or the um, or potentiator compounds. So you can, you can have a small molecule that specifically rehabilitates the function of, of, of a legioned or damaged protein. Um, so there's many, many ways you can kind of go back to a, a, a normal state from a disease state. You know, fix what's missing, knock something down that's causing the problem, go bypass, there's you know, many options. And there's many ways you can do that you know, therapeutically with a small molecule, with an RNAi, with an mRNA reagent, with a gene therapy reagent, with a CRISP. So you've got all these different options. So the, yeah, the BLN all for us is to find, in this case, a small molecule drug. But you, know, you could also imagine using these simple animals to inform you uh, of other genes to target by other ways, by knocking genes down or by putting genes back in. So we're committed to the small molecule approach initially, but really, once you have these animal models, you can do all kinds of things with them, not just looking for small molecule drugs. In our disease, it's a um, autoimmune disease. We have a mouse model that we've now been supplying to other researchers around the world. The disease does not progress the same in everyone. And we do have a orphan drug that works about 60% of the time. Mm. But biochemically, we seem to appear to be responders, but in actuality, the disease can progress over decades, or in my case, in eight years, I've gone from stage one to stage four. I'm in end stage now. How does the methodology of this approach deal with the variance of disease progression? Yeah, so we definitely are in the precision medicine spirit here. And so with this CRISPR uh, gene editing technology, you can go in and say, I don't want to just make any fruit fly with Neiman Pixie disease. I can make this particular version because I can put in this mutation. And you know, I can put in two bad copies, or I can put in this you know, bad copy one and then bad copy two. I can customize it. So that's the real power of gene editing is that across all the species that, that this technology has been tested on, it seems to work. And so you could therefore create exactly the same mutation or introduce the same mutation across the different species. So you know you're dealing with models that are themselves kind of similar. Because if, if they give different results, it could be because they're actually, they're not telling you the same thing. But if you can convince yourself that they're the same model because you can actually program them with the same mutation. And then you could at will, it's much easier to make a whole bunch of fruit flies representing a spectrum of mutations than it is to make all those mice, even though people definitely aspire to do that. And of course, then to cage them, maintain them, distribute them. Yeah, so. so we were, you were talking about um, different uh, strains of mice. Are mm -hmm. there equally as many strains of zebrafish available? So good question. So in, uh, depending on each animal, there tend to be like a couple of strains that are popular. Mm -hmm. Like there tends to be like one strain that everybody uses because generally it makes more sense if everyone's on the same page. But for 
you know, with the mice, there are literally are dozens and dozens. And it comes down to sometimes in Japan, for example, there are only breeds that are, that are there. Uh, I don't know the exact number for all the organisms. Yeast, for example, there, there are routinely three or four different strains that people use to do research. Uh, and that's generally the, the case. But the reality is all of the animals that I showed you, the ones that are propagated in the lab, they were domesticated or they are domesticated. They were once wild. So every yeast that's, or almost, almost every yeast that's used in every, any yeast lab in the world today can be traced back to a yeast that was found on a rotting fig in 1936 in Merced, California. So everything, you know, all these so-called strain, you can create a new strain anytime you want. The thing is you have to, if it's like something you plucked from nature, you probably want to, what they call inbreed it, because there's going to be a lot of other mutations floating around that you don't want to kind of control for. So there's that step of domesticating them or essentially inbreeding them. Um, and that can be done at will. And now with genome sequencing, you can probably make any individual a sort of model. Um, but then you can obviously go crazy and make everything. But it's possible. All right, just in time. All right, thank you. Uh, I think uh, the next session is at 345, so you guys can make your way out, and uh, we'll see you back in here for a biobanking discussion if you're interested. Thanks. I'm happy to talk to anyone. I'll hang around.